So the, the previous recordings, um, we did, um, we did the, the first one is posted with Sharon Simmons, who is an attorney who's done a lot of small scale development work. Uh, she's not an Indiana attorney, but she's done her work in Texas and other states. That recording is on the city's YouTube site. Um, the second one was also recorded uh, and I posted it to the YouTube site. It's not, uh, it's not quite uploaded yet, but it should be there very soon. So those two will be up there. Um, I do apologize. Unlike today, I forgot to hit record at the beginning of those two sessions. So I lost the first 15 minutes or so. Um, and then I remembered. So. Thank you for introducing yourselves in the chat window. Yeah, that's helpful. I um, recognize a few names here, uh, but it's but it's not the familiar um, group that I often work with. Uh, so this is awesome. Marty, just let me know when you want me to. I yeah, can, I think, I mean, jump, I haven't heard. 6, 6.35 seems like, an, you know, that's the reasonable time to wait. So I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, welcome everyone to the third in the series of um, small scale development support and, and networking. Um, we had a, an attorney on our first call. We had a real estate agent on our second call. And for tonight's session, we have an architect um, Jennifer Settle from, Jennifer, where are you located actually? You're in, I'm in Oak Park, just outside Oak Park, of Chicago. Chicago. Mm -hmm. Right, Oak Park, Chicago, which is the, the home the home stomping grounds of Frank Lloyd Wright. It for is, those of you yes. are architecture buffs. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marty Mecklenburg. I work with the city of South Bend um, on, uh, as part of the community investment team on, on, in a, on a team called an Engagement and Economic Empowerment. So I do a lot of engagement work across the city, but I also have a particular love and focus on helping small developers in South Bend be successful in their own neighborhoods, uh, which is how we got to know the incremental development folks and people like Jennifer who also share a, a similar passion. Um, so with that said, uh, Jennifer, I'll let you introduce yourself in more detail. We should also have Jim Kuhlman, who some of you may know. Uh, he's another consultant. He's based in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. He'll be joining us. To He also knows a lot about housing and housing development and architecture and working with banks and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, with that said, Jennifer, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Sounds good. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Marty said, well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be able to do this. Um, and I think some of you are on, but he mentioned this is sort of the first time we're showing some of this, this work uh, to you guys, and it's really made for local small developers. So I'm excited to see. Um, tonight's presentation is about how architecture and design can play an important role in supporting neighborhood infill and small scale development. Uh, Jennifer Settle, I have an urban design practice in Oak Park. So in addition to just being so a quick train ride away from you guys. Um, I have lots of ties back to, to South Bend as well. Um, I've been involved in a few different master plan, neighborhood master planning efforts, including Southeast neighborhood and near Northwest. Um, but my, my more recent professional work really started here in 2018 as part of that team from Incremental Development Alliance. Um, when we came to evaluate the local regulations and meet with city leaders and stakeholders to talk about um, some of the challenges that face small scale developers. Following those meetings, I was brought on as a consultant um, to help revamp the zoning ordinance. Um, and then that work led to the focus of today's presentation, which is designing um, a set of pre-approved buildings that align with those principles of small development. All that is really to say that I, I love South Bend. Um, I work with a lot of cities uh, doing both design work and zoning reform uh, and above and beyond South Bend has some of the most uh, has the most momentum in terms of locals willing to do the work and get creative uh, as well as the city leaders that are guiding initiatives to support this cause. Um, with all that said and I could go on all day um, about how much I, I truly appreciate working with the city of South Bend. Um, 
but you all know best, right? That this is still a really tough business and the process can certainly be improved at every turn. So I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about how design can help support, support your work. So this is sort of the, the rough outline of today's presentation from my end. Um, what are pre-approved buildings? Give a little background on, on some of those projects that I mentioned um, and how we came to, to, to bring about pre-approved buildings um, and then really dive into the principles of design that, that guided the, that work. So the city has undertaken numerous efforts to both inspire and incentivize locals to help build up and improve their own neighborhoods, but there are still challenges, right? New construction is really hard to get built, especially in, in the current market in South Bend and in neighborhoods where um, social and economic factors may be seen as unfavorable to new investment, right? Like many places, the, the cost to build new doesn't always align well with the average housing costs that people can afford or are willing to pay for. Uh, so the concept of pre-approved buildings are a tool that tries to get that work off the ground more quickly and cost effectively without compromising the character of the building, the architecture, right? When I first sat down with the Department of Community Investment, um, this, what you see up here was our goal. Uh, to create a resource that supported neighborhood infill and economic opportunities for locals by offering this pre-approved set of buildings. Um, these plans would assist with new construction of small to middle scale housing development um, by creating a catalog of buildings that were contextually appropriate and efficient. So we're trying to offer high quality architectural designs that come along with um, building and site development approval. Jennifer, can you go back one slide? Yeah, sure. You see these beautiful little buildings? These are real buildings that are fully designed that you can build. You can build. These are not just little icons that Jennifer <laughs> grabbed off Canva or something like that. These are real houses. And you guys are the first ones seeing these. Um, hey. They're even fun. Uh, we, you know, this is the this is what we consider the catalog of buildings. So we'll dive a little bit more into the nitty gritty, but. Um, we think they're pretty great and we really hope that this group in particular uses them. All right, so you, you can see this slide now, pre-approved building types. Is that the one you see? All right, so a team of architects worked with the city to hone in on, on five building types that would raise the level of design for economical infill de development. These range from um, a small accessory building that could go in the back of any lot to single family houses that fit on narrow or standard size urban lots, a two unit building in the same footprint, you know, as a single unit house. And then finally a small apartment with, with six units. Um, each plan was specifically calibrated for South Bend with consideration given to the current zoning regulations, the typical lot configurations, common construction techniques that local builders told us about um, and, and of course the market conditions. When we say pre-approved, that means that they've been vetted by the architects, but um, as well as the planning department and the building department to ensure that they already meet all applicable zoning regulations and building codes. So this review is what really translates to significant time and cost savings for small developers. An applicant that chooses to do one of those pre-approved buildings would pick their building from the catalog and then receive a set, a full set of architectural drawings to give to a contractor and, and run with. Um, they go through, you would go as an applicant using pre-approved, you would go through the same application process, um, but the only item that you need to provide then is a site plan for your specific lot. Um, we give you all sort of the other information. The exception for this was that small apartment any building over two units requires additional drawings and spe um, specifications by an engineer that um, has to go to state level review. So that's the only one that requires additional drawings beyond the site plan. For the rest of the buildings though, it pre-approved buildings, um, the process facilitates sort of a smoother and quicker timeline between conception of a project, purchasing a lot, and then actually receiving a build building permit. So anyone who has seen Monty Anderson present, right? I think he's become a pretty familiar face around the around there. Um, knows that he's. You probably heard his story 
about building your team, right? And he specifically calls out a warning that developers often encounter, right? This, this problem that they hire a great architect who then takes a couple of months to draw this really great plan. And then you build out the project and it comes in twice your budget, right? I'm probably guilty of designing those projects at one point in time. Um, but so now you've spent $20,000 on architecture plans and you're nowhere closer to getting it built, right? Getting your project built. The Incremental Development Alliance has long advocated for developers to be able to draw a quick site plan and floor plan to talk shop with your local HVAC and lumber yard, right? Because that knowledge adds value and understanding of what design decisions will work for your next project. Um, the pre-approved buildings have tried to do a little bit of that legwork for you in order to save you that time and money um, and mistakes and things like that, that you run into. Or, um, so we went through the process of vetting these buildings with the lumber yard, with the electricians, the HVA suppliers, um, along with multiple builders to ensure that they were as tight and efficient as possible. So you can see here on the right, a potential breakdown um, of some of the cost and time savings the current cost estimate for a duplex, for the duplex that we show here, uh, we're coming back between $320,000 and $370,000 for two units. Um, the typical architecture fees generally run about 7 to 10% of your construction costs. So if we used 8% on a $350,000 building, your savings for those design fees would be about $28,000. Not insignificant, right? Not mounds of money but certainly significant. Um, this might be a little less for single family house, but potentially much larger for more complicated building, the more complicated buildings or sites. Um, there's also the time factor, which anyone who's owned property or sitting on property or building knows that that's, that matters. Um, South Bend has a pretty quick timeline for permit review, um, at least on paper, but the time saved in designing um, a product from scratch and then avoiding all of those missed code requirements or having to come back to the table back and forth when, you know, to understand the zoning regulations and things like that has the potential to save many months as well. So before we really get into the design of these buildings, I think it's important to acknowledge that this project um, is really building upon previous work that the city has undertaken. I'm going to show a few of those things. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Incremental Development Alliance came in 2018. We ran numerous site plans and pro formas on proposed projects um, or potential buildings that really helped inform re what regulations needed to change and what building types were most viable. Uh, there's also been recent market studies that helped us understand the demand for new housing, but also the demographics of who wanted housing so that we could design these products to meet those needs um, the city itself, the planning department has a ton of data, right, where we can track where vacant parcels are, what projects are being built, how many permits or variances are being issued. And then, of course, um, there's been numerous neighborhood plans that have helped us understand the fabric of the cities and where opportunities for new investment exist. So these are all things that, that have happened in South Bend that informed our work. Most notably in January 2020, the city adopted an updated zoning ordinance that removed significant barriers to small scale development, um, particularly for the city's urban neighborhoods. The city had been making small changes based on um, some of the work that InkDev did, but this was really the, the big overhaul. Um, one of the most important aspects of those changes was that the city re-legalized a wider range of housing types they also work to make these really tedious regulations more understandable and user-friendly, particularly for small developers and people wanting to get things built on small parcel, infill parcels. Yeah. The new regulations are not, certainly not a silver bullet, but they are now much more informed by the DNA of South Bend. And by that, I mean what they're informed by what exists in the neighborhoods, but also by what is actually feasible to, to build in today's market. So this is sort of my personal, I don't know if Jim's on here, but he's heard this too often. This is sort of my personal PSA um, to all those that care about architecture. 
that do architecture or care about how your neighborhood looks, right? The regulations matter. It will be an uphill battle if you're trying to do something that your zoning code does not allow. Um, design and the physical makeup of your city is really what should inform your local regulations. And in most cases, in most cities, this isn't the case. Um, zoning ordinances are really boring. I do them all the time, I love them, but they're boring legal documents. Um, but we have to understand how they often dictate the design. Um, before South Bend adopted these changes, you could not legally build on a very small parcel. And you couldn't, it was hard to find a parcel in the city that made sense for a fourplex, right? So the new zoning ordinance really opened up uh, the door for us to do something like pre-approved buildings. Go ahead, yeah. Well, did you have to clean up the front row? Sorry, I, I don't know. Oh, Maybe that was an accident. I think that was somebody asking. Yeah. There was a question in the chat window um, hmm. from Allison asking. So we, five plans were picked to develop in greater detail, and she's wondering how who who chose those five plans, or how how was the decision made to focus on those five versus some of the other ones? Yeah, sure. I can jump into that, and I apologize. I'm terrible at monitoring the chat window while I'm presenting. That's, that's, so that's my job. So don't worry about it. We got you. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm answering some stuff to the text too as well, Excellent. Jennifer. So good, we won't have enough time to uh, to probably answer all the questions. So we'll get some of them as we go, and then some of them that we need to have more from you will do that. At yeah. the end, and and please ask them again if we miss them here. Um, yeah, let me go back to that slide for you, Allison. Um, I see that she has a second question too about ADA and senior friendly. So sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, and I'll get into this a little bit more later in the design, and we can circle back if if they're not all answered then too. Um, but the five buildings, we actually started with 10 building types, right? Little dimensions that we had rough floor plans. And um, we really did the work of testing them on South Bend's lot. We looked at the performance to see which ones were the most viable. Um, but we also looked at and spoke with um, numerous developers in the community, but also the city staff um, and builders to say, what are the products that are most needed now? Um, I advocate for a lot of missing middle in my work, and I do a lot of this, that middle scale housing. Um, but what we found is it was really these narrow lots that the ones that were being toughest in South Bend to build on. And so having that narrow single family house and that narrow duplex um, were important to the city. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about the types later, but we really started with this big palette and idea of, of buildings each with, you know, do we need a two bedroom? Do we need a four bedroom? Do we need a tinier house, a tiny house? Um, and we tested all of those things on city lots and then worked with the city to, to, to pick the, the first round. We hope there'll be more in the future, but um, we, we tried to pick the ones that seem to make sense in the short term. Um, and I think the other questions like ADA will come up will be more easily explained later. So let's circle back to that one um, for sure. So the city did all of um, this work to identify that that these types of small and middle scale development sort of play a critical role uh, in supporting locally serving retail and transportation options. You know, we know diversity of housing can be part of the solution for affordability and neighborhood safety, right? All these good things. Um, but the city recognized pretty quickly that even though these were allowed now, it wasn't that easy, right? We know there are many vacant parcels um, that need new construction or more affordable housing options in South Bend. Here is one common example of an existing South Bend block, right? The, but the projects weren't penciling out. Um, there's still this financial gap between the cost to build new and making housing that is affordable or even market rate. So what do we do next to help bridge that gap a little bit at a time? Um, what can we do incrementally, right? That provides another bit of help um, while also improving the quality of housing that was being provided. Um, so this isn't, pre-approved buildings aren't some big giant financial subsidy, right? Um, but we believe that offering a set of efficient housing options can be one resource that takes a little more burden off of small developers and that is actually more accessible to more people rather than you know a straight financial assistant program that 
likely requires a lawyer an extensive application or all of these sort of complicated things, um, this is one tool that we think can be really accessible. So with those ideas and information in mind, the city created this team to evaluate and design the pre-approved buildings. Uh, the architecture side was made up of myself and Jennifer Griffin, uh, an architect out of Tulsa, who's a graduate and former visiting professor at Notre Dame School of Architecture, as well as Pat Lynch, who works with the South Bend Heritage Foundation. And we worked really closely with Jim, um, our moderator and our, you know, he's, I think all of you guys know him pretty well at this point, right? Um, and he continually ran those cost estimates and performance for all the designs um, while also reviewing them with local builders and trades to make sure that the decisions we were making were both cost effective and made sense at every point in the process from laying the foundation to the preferred roof trusses, right? This idea of pre-approved buildings aren't a particularly new idea. Catalogs that offered um, basic, comfortable, affordable homes to the middle class played a critical role in development throughout the early 1900s. Um, you may be familiar with the Sears catalog like this one. Um, anyone in America could pick out a house from a catalog and a kit of supplies and directions would be shipped to their local de depot, like right down to the screw and nail. And then a local contractor would build it. Um, the concept behind it was that you could see exactly what you were getting and understand those costs and materials that were required. They were typically simple and repeated with little mod modifications to add variety. One of the most notable things about them, about these neighborhoods of catalog homes, um, I actually live in one from 1906, my whole block is, um, was that they provide a high level of craftsmanship, but they kept it affordable because developers mass produced the home homes on small lots a couple blocks at a time, right? So this economy of scale. There are also a handful of cities in the US that have done pre-approved, but only a few um, recently. So Bryan, Texas, which I show here, has sort of led the way. Um, their process is pretty different than ours, but they did provide guidance for how these could be implemented. So that brings us to, I think, the fun stuff. Um, these were our six, right, six uh, guiding principles that really informed our work on the pre-approved buildings, but I think they're applicable to anyone doing projects at this scale. First up, the, the buildings really should fit well with the character of the existing neighborhood, especially when we're talking about infill. We like as all sorts of styles of architecture, but it was for this reason that we really focused on utilizing more traditional uh, designs with simple and straightforward details that you might find throughout South Bend. The building footprints, meaning the width and the depth of these buildings, were informed by the most common lot widths, um, and so they easily fit within the average setbacks that we find um, in South Bend's uh, neighborhood zones. And whether the building has one unit or two unit or three, um, shouldn't really matter if the building scale and the character fit within the context. So we really focused on using similar building heights and massing. One note uh, um, relates to the last slide. If you, if you Google house plans on the internet, right? Pinterest is awesome. You will find a plethora of free floor plans. You can even buy building sets, right? But the problem is that there aren't a lot of stock plans that fit on these size lots or with the character of an urban neighborhood. All right, so next principle, keep it simple. You'll notice pretty quickly that these are all boxes, right? We don't jog the exterior wall or see any bump outs. There's no dormers or fancy things happening on the roofs. Um, this is because all of those extra moves add to the overall cost. We really had to show restraint. But if a building is well composed and uses good proportions with simple roofs, it doesn't need to distract you with those extra features. We also think it's really important that rectangle buildings fit on most sites, right? They can still form interesting spaces. Um, these are two site plans using the narrow house design. The narrow house footprint is here and it's also here. Um, there's variation in the possible site configurations. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later in, in the adaptability principle. Um, 
but rectangles are not boring, but they are really easy to, to build. This is where I think things really get fun, this next principle, right? How do we do these simple repeatable houses, but bring in a diversity of character and hit a, hit a range of price points? So we produced this variety using a really simple approach. Each plan has three elevation options. Um, so each of those five buildings that you saw have five or have three elevations that go along with them that you could choose from. This allows for some diversity in character as well as a range of construction costs. Um, all these options still fit really well with the character of existing neighborhoods. Um, so while they're just five building types, the number of designs become, um, the designs that are available become larger. So for example, this is one of the pages from the catalog. You'll see this is a three bedroom, two and a half bath standard house. Um, but there are three facade options you can choose from all using the same plan, right? The dimensions of the building footprint don't change. The base option utilizes a gable roof with sort of an open eave um, and really simple porch details. Uh, the next design shows a hipped roof, um, a closed eave that's really common in new construction and sturdier por porch columns without a railing, right? Uh, the third concept shows an additional level of craftsman type detail with this sort of shallow gable roof, decorative brackets, uh, and, a, and a low wall for the porch. Uh, variations in those window configurations also add to the number of uh, possible facade like variations that you would see in the neighborhood. So this gives an applicant a choice of designs, but also allows a developer to potentially do multiple pre-approved buildings on a block without without losing that diversity. You're getting some feedback there. I just took care okay. of it. Okay, thank you. So we use that same philosophy for each of the building types, carrying through those same details, even to the smallest option of the carriage house, um, allowing it to work together with those other those other houses. And we modified those details and roof types to be appropriate for the scale of the largest building. Um, but the principle and construction methods remain the same, right? Really simple shapes, straightforward details, and small modifications that all use the same plan. So from those simple variations, you get a lot of options. Um, and the pre-approved plan allow, plans allow for um, flexibility in siding materials and exterior colors. Um, so even from what you see here, uh, the possibilities are really wide open. All right, this might be my favorite design principle. Um, along the same lines as the facade options, it's really important to understand that the public face of the building should get the most attention, right? We believe strongly that buildings should make the street better, right? Building front should be special while the back and the side of the building can be utilitarian. Um, that's where the parking and the trash and the meters go. This is really true for most building types from you know, single family houses to multifamily and, and through commercial. Um, in retail, we know it's critical design principle, right? We know it's critical that if you make the street more interesting um, and the shop fronts more welcoming, it's better for business. Well, the same applies to residential neighborhoods that if the street is interesting and comfortable to walk through that add, adds value to both the house, right? Um, that curb appeal, um, but also adds value to the neighborhood. Um, sorry. So we really focused on, on the, those front facades. They don't have to be fancy, but we do require things like a porch that can actually be used while also giving a semi-private space um, fronting onto that street, right? We really focused on the composition of the, the front windows to be aligned with each other and the front door is visible. Um, we focused on a few critical details to get right for the sake of quality design. So those included things like window surrounds, roof eaves, front porch columns and railings. All of these things, um, while they might add a little extra cost, their value is, is more significant. Um, on the side fa facades and the rear facades, however, you start to see those things fall away. Um, we even allow flexibility in these plans that you could remove the trim or the awning um, 
over the door if you wanted, if they're on the side and the rear facade. Um, we don't care as much, right? So there's that flexibility uh, on the side and rear of the buildings that can be a cost, cost savings. We did want to make sure, I'll point out this one here, um, that one of the side facades was really well composed in the case that um, it was on a corner lot. Because if it's facing a street, we really want it to have those windows. We want it to have that, that character. But if it's on an interior lot, the pre-approved plans allow you to remove some of those windows to save cost and things like that. The next principle is sort of along that same notion um, that quality cost-effective details really make a difference. So these are elements that often get lost at the very end of the design process where we value engineer um, projects to deliver them as low cost as possible. Um, we aren't adding a ton of detail to these houses, so we want to make sure that the ones we include are high quality, but as easy and cost effective to construct as possible. So when we look at the porch columns, right, or the posts here, we assumed we use standard pieces of lumber. None of these elevations require you to get specialty items like prefab columns, right, although you can if you wish, right, but the base designs all show basic lumber pieces. Um, this page also shows the detailed drawings and information that's in our permit sets. These are the three different eave types. Um, this is more than what is necessary to apply for a permit in South Bend. It's even more than some contractors need. Um, but we think it really serves as a learning tool for folks to easily and cost effectively get the design and the construction details right, um, especially if this is your first project or if it's a new type for you. Um, and we also really studied um, recent built examples from our colleagues. This is a really simple um, post, but when paired with this railing, the whole composition gives that character even though there's no detail on this post, right? Um, and simple details like the skirt board are a cost effective way to treat a really plain foundation wall. Um, we also talk to, these are examples from South Bend local builders to really understand what they're inclined to do on their projects and incorporate some of those um, techniques. So the final principle um, is adaptability. We really want these plans to be a resource for as many lots and as many people as possible. So this is where while we're starting with just these five building types, there's an additional level of variety um, that allows for a much wider range. We've talked about the flexibility in the exterior facade that give people different choices in the look of the house. And we sort of touched on the different site configurations, right? That these could be used on interior lots, corner lots, um, or also in groups of buildings, like a cottage court that we showed. Uh, but we also wanted them to be adaptable to different household size and potential growth over time. And so you can see here for two of the buildings, we include an option for a master suite addition that could be built initially um, or at a later date if the family grows or decides they need a little bit bigger. Um, it doesn't change the street character and most lots are very deep. And so we worked with a size there um, that could, could add that adaptability, especially to the single family homes if you think about them as starting small. Um, again, part of the reason for um, including a carriage house in this first five set of buildings was that it could also be built on the back of a lot at a later date for any one of these other buildings, right? So it adds that um, adaptability over time. So this is showing that master suite, but a person could also use that same extension for an attached garage or an office, right? We're all working from home, many of us. Um, I, for one, would take that a little bit extra space. It also, there's flexibility baked into this process that would also allow you to have a side entrance um, down to the basement to accommodate additional living spaces. Um, these all, all these projects could be built with or without basements to save those associated costs. Um, so while an applicant can't change the exterior dimension, they can modify many of the details to fit their preference and their budget you know, including those details we talked about, as well as the, the side and rear composition. The final note on adaptability is that we always intended the, the pre-approved buildings to be used in, in two ways, right? The, the primary way 
is that someone can take these drawings and go straight to a builder, right? But we also hope that these buildings are used as inspiration, right? To generate new takes on some of these building types. Um, these aren't common in today's construction market, right? The houses are more narrow than many home builders' typical products. Uh, certainly duplexes and sixplexes haven't been built with much frequency in, in recent years. So we hope that the simplicity and ef efficiencies of these plans uh, really provide a reference point that allow you to get really creative and run with it. Um, those deviations, like the bottom row here, wouldn't go through necessarily the pre-approved process, but they certainly give you a significant head start on figuring out the plan and the parameters that, that, that work. So I think that wraps up our design principles. We think that they really do apply for most projects, big or little. Um, I think there's some caveats for, for rehab um, that are different, but for the most part, um, we think they sort of apply across the board um, and we hope that we've been able to implement them um, in, in these plans. So I, as we mentioned at the start, we have just finished up this process and the city is, is working to finalize the logistics of offering them. You're really the first public preview of the, of the catalog and the permit sets. Um, but we really hope it becomes a tool that you take advantage of and, and can use in your work. So with that, um, I'm happy to open up to questions and, and happy to connect offline too. Jim, why don't, why don't you jump in with the two questions that came in online um, in case yeah. folks were not following the chat window and then we can circle back to additional questions for Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer, can you uh, talk a little bit more about how uh, accessibility and universal design fits into, especially the first floors, and uh, uh, particularly also a little bit maybe talking about the duplex and the sixplex, because a lot of people may understand accessibility from, for those uh, types of buildings in a, in a single family house, but uh, they're even more important in the single, the first floors of, the, uh, of those multi-unit buildings. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think working our way down, the one that, you know, um, is required by ADA was the sixplex. And so we do show sort of this ramp that would be, um, this is an ideal building for a corner lot. And so the idea is that you would have an entrance off the side street and come in. And so all the units on the ground floor were built um, to provide those ADA turning circles and access and, and door widths and things like that. Um, it gets a little bit harder to provide those things on the smaller buildings, um, but the width of the duplex can accommodate um, a ramp as needed. They're pre they're raised off the ground because that's um, in terms of privacy and, and how it sits on the site. We always think that that's helpful um, to give that height and take them, you know, three steps sort of off the ground. Um, but all of the ground floors are made open and ADA widths for things for accessing um, and certainly this idea that they could be built with or without um, a basement and and it's we're sort of learning of what needs to get built and so I think the conversation of um, could these be built at grade um, is something you know we we allow for flexibility with the city to talk through and, and an understanding that um, the ideal condition would be to have sort of a ramp off the side entrance so that you can keep maintain that height above um, for the porch and access to the door. Jim, did that hit you? You've thought about this too a bunch. Um, yeah, I think just it's yeah. partly the the the, uh, the building code. Uh, there's a difference in the building code requirements when you go from the duplex to the six, and so there's a bunch of other things that kick in, um, not in the building, not only in the building code, but in in, in sort of universal design ordinances and, and guidance that we have. Uh, the Fair Housing Act is a, is a different thing. It's not in the building code, but um, gets that. Uh, some of you may be surprised perhaps that that small apartment building doesn't require an elevator, for instance. Um, and so um, there are different provisions for how many units you can have on a floor and so forth. So one of the reasons why um, the sixplex was chosen uh, was because it was a size and configuration that would allow, um, it's very difficult to make the design or the uh, financial performer work on buildings with elevators um, in, in, in most parts in the South Bend. And so being able to find these, these uh, historical walk-up building types um, is not just about fitting the neighborhood, but it's also just fitting within the financial feasibility 
that current sales prices and rent prices can support not just in a couple of neighborhoods in town with high rents, but throughout the throughout the city. So um, some of the some of the models were chosen because of their ability to be cost effective in some cases. So that's a, another sort of spin on on why some of these things are what they are, uh, and and why there were more two story models chosen in that way. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, basements? Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the suites there, uh, Jen, in terms of where those add-ons work, but I think the basements are also important. Uh, many of these, uh, the, the three in the middle there have basements. Mm -hmm. um, what's the flexibility you know, that those provide for both uh, future expansion as well as uh, maybe, I don't know if you pointed out, I didn't remember you pointing out like the window wells and stuff that are required in those basements as well for those purposes. Right. So, um, yes, I'll get to that. The, the one follow-up I would say on the, the accessibility um, and ADA is that, right, we were trying to design these as tight as possible, but we also made sure to, you know, have typical and required hallway widths um, and, and make them really flow easily um, to, to really provide for a range of, of age and abilities. Um, within these houses while keeping them as tight as possible. Um, so some of them are so, certainly better suited than others, but the idea with the flexibility um, that we like is that really the interior spaces um, are sort of, as long as you're not changing windows and bearing walls, you can modify these plans and pick which kitchen cabinets you want or where your sink is um, pretty easily without having to hire an architect, right? You can work with your builder to make um, even further adaptions to the floor plan to accommodate your needs. Um, second question regarding the basement. So the, the three that Jim pointed to, the two houses and the duplex, we designed them that they would have, like they would have a basement, right? So that we could accommodate that. Um, but each of the permit sits, so you can see here, um, this stair, you come in the door and the stair goes up. On, on almost all of these cases, right? Um, and the plans show a staircase down to a basement. And we show a basement plan for an unfinished basement that could be easily finished out. And in the basement plan, we provide for a light well that you would need if you wanted to finish it out and things like that. Um, so that was sort of the middle ground of, of making sure we were meeting all the code so that you could finish it out, but not adding that extra expense at the first round. Um, so if a person wanted to say, just do a, a building um, slab on grade, this door here that goes down to the basement could easily just be turned. And we show this in the plan, note it that this could just be turned into a closet, right? Or an extra door outside. Um, so because accommodating those stairs down is the harder option um, in terms of space and utility, we showed that. Um, but we do note that you could close that off. I think the second point, right, you, so you could use that basement then, um, for example, on the duplex as additional living space for the ground floor unit, or if it's allowed um, in your zone, you could get an in-law unit down there um, or things like that and have a separate entrance to that, to that space. So it's a lot of flexibility in that, in that respect. Did that answer? I think so. And if it's not, put it in the chat or we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep going. So um, the next one, Jen, is um, a little bit about, um, to paraphrase, uh, how do you just not take the same model and line them up down a whole block, right? Because we have plenty of blocks in, in South Bend where there's more empty lots than we got buildings. Yeah. Um, and, and talk a little bit more about, maybe you can flip back to that front, that front page or some of this here too, because I think that that when we had all the elevations also kind of gets to, to the intent of how, how to prevent that because uh, probably a little too much time was spent trying to figure out exactly, you know, how to prevent that and how to, how to provide options without being overwhelming. Yeah, so I think they referenced sort of the zoning code um, dictates one that you can't sort of come on too many lots and, and really just sort of um, do a full block scale. Um, but the idea is the economy of scale for a developer that wants to do four of these on a block, a parcel, 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 um, that there's, there's enough um, really easy variety to add. Um, and because they're you know, going through the permit process and choosing to do these plans for um, 
through the city, the city can have that conversation with the developer and sort of facilitate, all right, we want um, a little more variety. And um, to, to ease the worry of anyone who looks at these and says they're not that different, I want to point out, uh, you know, I think I mentioned that my my block um, and the this surrounding blocks to me are all from a catalog, not a Sears catalog, but a Chicago catalog from 1906. Um, they are all the same four square house, no closets. We have done a much better job of a foot, right? They were as efficient as possible. Um, they are, you know, 24 feet by 24 feet. That's the size of many garages these days. Um, but this is actually two houses on my block. This one's mine. Um, you can see that they're pretty much the same floor plan, but you get a lot of variety. And I, I more, thought about grabbing a full aerial view so you could see the variety. But over time, um, with paint colors, with door choices, um, with the variations in roof, uh, with various in landscaping, you really get that variety um, without having to change the building itself, the, the you know envelope of the building that much. Um, so there's that flexibility of uh, being able to choose, even just you see here, um, the width of the siding, right? And how that changes the character. This is four inch, this is probably eight inch, right? The colors, the configuration of those windows, you know, this is the master bedroom on both of these. Um, so it's the same floor plan, but the variation, because we allow for different colors, different materials, different porch details, really does go a long way. Jen, can you flip back to those three uh, uh, section details you had that showed the three different houses? I think one of the key parts that we were worried about in terms of um, getting variation was bad variation, right? Uh, people trying to do mm -hmm. variation, but not knowing how to get good details uh, for that variation. And so um, the details that were provided that, that Jen showed here, uh, the oh, two slides, sure. yeah, were to help make sure that oh, you could provide three different looking porch details um, and you provide, and they were provided the details for the three different porches so that you could easily, so if the city wants to have a conversation saying, we're going to you know, say the city owns a lot of vacant lots, someone wants to buy some lots for the city. The city as a condition of buying the lots or as a condition of using the plans can say, hey, if you're gonna put three of these in the row, you gotta pick more than one porch type. And that's not a burden because we did all three versions of the porch types and gave you the details so your builder can order the materials differently. And it's not that big a burden because it's just the front or it's just the, the, the windows or just whatever. So um, th those are things that were baked into the detailed construction drawings that you're not really seeing too much of tonight. This is just the only real slide. But by doing that, by, by baking these into the drawings, the wall section or the uh, porch details, that, that can be provided easily without you know, mandating too much of a burden as a part of being able to do the plans. So, um, And one of, the, one of the things is that developers will, you know, um, apply the same, right? They want to get that economy of scale. That's that's part of the business, and and that's a good, you know, method for them to save money. And so the fact that they could do three or four houses um, and just change the exterior, it's really in the interior. They could do the same um, subway tile in all the bathrooms, and it's the same amount in every bathroom, right? And so these are really sort of working with that model for better or worse, right? Like that's. Um, giving them a plan that has that variety, but also offers them that ability to, to really have the same interior finishes and things like that if they, if they wanted. Um, I'm gonna come back a couple questions here related to this, but I, I think um, the city is still working through its own procedures uh, for how it is going to put these out. Um, Jen, there's a couple of questions that are related to process. Some of which I think we can provide an overview for, some of which I think is yet to be determined. So can you can you walk through what does it mean to be pre-approved versus similarly approved? Or like what is the general arc of, hey, uh, I'm fired up today. I want to go get me one of these um, at date point that will be announced in the future. We don't have a date quite yet for the city launching. But when that date comes, what will that process largely look like to, to get a copy of you know that set you just showed in that, that picture? Yeah. So... So the 
the building catalog that shows all of these rendered, the colored elevations and things like that, and the plans with their programs um, is available, will be available publicly um, for you to sort of peruse and test on your site and, and understand the lot sizes, all the dimensions are there. Um, and so those are sort of open source. And then the idea is that you would contact the Department of Community Investment um, and say, hey, I want to do the stacked duplex. Uh, and they would, for a small fee to be determined, but far less than those architectural fees, um, would give you, then send you um, this full set for that particular building. And so this comes down to, um, we have sets ready, permit sets ready. Um, if you say, I just want the standard house, I don't want the, I don't want the addition, you would get that set. If you said, I think I want, you know, that master suite, then we would give you the set for that full standard house with the master suite, whether you wanted to do it now or later. Um, and then you would go through the same permit process that you do now for if you're doing, you know, so for the duplex down for all four of these, it's the same new construction um, permit pr application for these projects. And then you would, um, you'd get a survey, just like you would do for your normal project, and you draw your really simple site plan, showing that this building works on your lot and meets all the setbacks. Um, and then, so it's the same process from then on, except that the city's already, the planning and building department have already reviewed it. So instead of the um, average five to seven days, I think it was, we have it in the, the process notes, but um, they would do it in two days. Um, and review it and it, it's a much smoother timeline. They know you already meet all the building codes. So they don't have to check for that. They know um, you meet right the requirements of all the zoning, right? So if you look here, um, we have on each of the pages, sorry, let me find that. Sorry to jump so much. Um, trying to find the plan. So on, on here, if you look in the lower left corner in the building catalog, it tells you all the zoning districts that this building is allowed in. Those are the same ones that you would find in the zoning ordinance. It's just here for your reference. So you can easily say, all right, is the standard at my lot that I own that I'm thinking about developing is in the U2 district, so I can do this. Um, and this building is made to, to match all the height requirements, all of the, the setbacks, the porch minimums, things like that. Um, the city knows these have already been vetted for that. Um, so the pre-approved process really comes that um, you get at the same time approval and your building plans, right? And all you have to provide is a site plan. And so that, that normal timeline of three to six months of designing a building and fitting it on a site and testing it um, gets much shorter and smoother. Um couple of questions that sort of follow up on some of the details and so forth. Um, I, I think it's, it gets to be determined, uh, but because the city controls the process of someone coming and saying, I have an address, I have a lot, I want to put this building on that. It's, you're not just, the city's not just handing out plans without an actual property to somebody who has control of that property. So this is not just like, here, have some plans and go think about them. Uh, when they hand out the construction documents, the ones you kind of see that the black and white ones with lots of detail, um, they will be attached to specific addresses. And so um, I, the specific policy has not been created yet for the bulk purchase type of thing. Uh, but certainly if, if there are a number of other pre-approved plans on the same block where other, where, you know, someone else or the same developer has already developed, um, the city will have purview to say, actually, we think it's very important uh, if you're gonna use this pre-approved plan to do the variety. Now, we're, we're not the city, <laughs> so we're not gonna say that it is or isn't gonna happen, but we will certainly, uh, because Jen and I are, are, are helping to finish out that part of the process right now, we will certainly put that kind of feedback into uh, the folks making those decisions and writing that final policy for consideration. Um, and that's that's where some of these uh, details have to be ironed out about how does the process work. And um, you know, part of the reason for creating the pre-approved plans in the first place is to get more visual consistency and to be able to uh, know what you're getting. And so 
um, at least we have a, a bar <laughs> that the buildings might look similar, right? But they're also gonna look similar in a way that is similar to the character of the existing neighborhood. And as Jenna already pointed out, many neighborhoods have similar looking buildings. Um, and because they're scaled and they're detailed well, so when you're walking down the street, not driving down the street, they look correct. Uh, that, that makes a big difference. Most buildings you get off of stock plan websites have very, very poorly designed and detailed front facades. And so um, even if you put 20 of these in a row with the same details on a block, it's not going to be offensive because it will, they will all fit together in that way. So I think um, we'll leave that to a future rollout of, of those policies from the city. Um, but it is it is possible to to do that, and I, I think that there's there's an intention to uh, not have. Um, if, if there was no intention to do that, then Jen wouldn't have had to have drawn uh, 18 different facades. So yeah, it's, oh, it's, go good, ahead. it's it's good feedback, Joni, and I will bring that back to the folks making the decision. But I could easily see a, a policy saying, you know, if you're going to put two next to one another, you have to choose one of the alternate facade plans, for example, and have that be a requirement. So we'll, we'll bring that feedback back to the to the planners. Yeah, and they've been really receptive. I mean, through the zoning code, right? As if um, I, I still get emails today and phone calls um, saying, hey, we've got these projects and they're having trouble interpreting this rule or this isn't working for what they want to do. And this is coming up again and again. How can we revise it to make it work? So I don't know that you guys get to see that part because um, they're the enforcers of rules, but um, they really do work with us to make sure these are living and meeting the needs of projects today. Um, and we really work with them to make sure they were following all the zoning rules and providing all the, the meeting all the minimums for those things. Um, and then I think I saw something about sort of parking and porch and storage and things like that. Those all would come up in your site plan, right? If you want a garage that provides extra bike storage, um, that's pretty easy to show on, on the, the um, on the site plan, right? And so um, things like that, uh, it all matches with the existing zoning code and all those rules are, are still applicable and, and in play um, for anything else. You know, so the house itself meets all those rules and pre-vetted um, and then the garage and, and outbuildings are, are sort of follow the same rule of just showing a site plan. There are separate rules for accessory structures in the new code that I think are a little less um, overbearing and uh, uh, quixotic. So uh, I think yeah, if you haven't looked at the new code, that, that maybe it's a lot easier to figure out what can go where and how big it can be. Yeah. And, and there's a lot more flexibility now um, in the code of not having to provide um, parking, right? By, by the zoning regulations, you're not required to. Most ones will want to and will show it. Um, and if you do, you have to meet the setbacks for that and things like that. But um, these were all tested on, on multiple site configurations with alleys, without alleys, to make sure that you could provide two spaces of parking behind these in a garage off an alley and things like that. So we, we tested a lot of those site configurations. So even if we don't show the particular garage, we know it, you know, we've we've checked that it works and can provide for those those needs. Uh, I can't remember if it came up in one of the site plans because you have written the ones, but they're, they're inside the construction document set that you get after you get going. Um, there is a page that includes a couple of those sample site plans so that you can kind yeah. of see a little bit more detailed um, how they fit on a site together uh, or, or the different options, alley versus no alley, et cetera. Um, all right. Um, I think we got, so you picked up that one on, on porches and bike storage and so forth. Um, let's see, I think that was most of them that we hit. One of the other, I think I reviewed, um, I saw some mention, I'm not gonna be able to find it now, but um, one of the things um, that the city has talked about and we've talked about um, with, with different builders that use different um, prefab systems, sustainable systems, um, you, what it was the other, like concrete wall systems, like all these possibilities for the future. Um, and we are not opposed to those. We're excited to see where those go um, to varying levels of, you know, skepticism. But I think all of those are in play, right? So we, for example, right, um, there are multiple um, 
sustainability you know paths for the energy code and we baked those options into these plans so we accommodated um two by six exterior walls they're not required by code you could do a two by four wall but we made sure that we were accommodating that extra and that all the rooms and bedrooms worked for that larger th that larger um wall thickness right um and we know some of the the newer energy sufficient uh, uh energy efficient um, building systems have an either even thicker wall, um, but because we're using modules that are really simple and follow lumber, that was our basic basic starting off point that we wanted to give you. So this was like really easy stick building that most builders use. Um, but that's not to say that those systems can't be used with the same floor plan, right? If you can fit that building um, width and and not compromise the the room sizes. Um, as long as the exterior dimension stays the same and the facade has the same windows and proportion of windows, um, there's there's flexibility to allow those those things to evolve. Um, and like Jim mentioned, you know, we, this is a new tool and it hasn't been done in many cities to where the building and planning department is so involved in, in offering it and testing these um, that we will be ecstatic if, if a developer comes to us and says, I want to do five of these. Um, you know, they're really small and efficient. The goal was to offer them to small developers, right, who don't have this big catalog of floor plans already. Most builders have sort of their go-to models. Um, the, the audience for this is, is varied, but we really had sort of the person, the small developer who's doing their first project or wants to try a duplex um, in mind. Um, and the conversation, we've had this conversation with the city about what if you know, scenarios. And I think um, we will figure that out and, and make sure that the variety um, gets applied. Um, but if if we have people, you know, like, like carriage houses, right, we allow them and people get really worried that they're going to show up all over their neighborhood. But even then the most progressive cities that have allowed these outright, um, it's very few, right? maybe one per block gets built. Um, and so I think we will be ecstatic and ready to face that um, if if we get, you know, 30 applications for this as a challenge, by the way, um, to do these. That's a good segue to the question that Andres just put in the window, Jim. Yeah, the challenge, absolutely. The challenge. I'll read this one because it's good. Uh, so the the pre-approval process uh, could speed up the permitting process plus save on our technical fees. Are these savings of time and money significant enough to get people to do this and we'll move the pro forma? Um, so Jen, can you talk a little bit about the, the time is probably less with the actual city review and more in the time and energy to develop a plan that fits on the lots that we have presently in South Bend versus the ones you can find on the internet that might be cheap but are not appropriate. <laughs> yeah, so most, right, most stock plans that you find um, with very few exceptions um, are, are for more suburban lots, right? And certainly, you know, 50 to 70, 50 to 80 foot lots. Um, it gets even more outrageous if you're looking at any sort of multifamily. Um, but, but really the house plan offerings are, are for suburban style with the, the garage um, in front and wider floor plans. Um, and those don't match up with the lots that South Bend has. So we really studied um, through past projects, but also just as you know, our design team really honed in and, and um, what are the average lot sizes, what are the minimum lot sizes that exist on the ground today? Um, and they're between 33 feet and 40 feet predominantly in the urban neighborhoods. Um, and I, I would challenge you to find stock plans on the internet that actually like fit that. That's very hard to find. And it's it, even as a designer, um, you know, for other cities, it's tricky to find a, a building floor plan that meets the needs of today's families, today's, um, you know, empty nesters and young professionals that, that work um, on narrow lots, right? Because you have to provide um, all these different amenities, but also code requirements. And so that time to design a new building from scratch on a lot um, 
that's really where you're seeing, you know, 60 days is sort of that average low end for a designer to, to, to crank out a building set, um, a construction set that you could build from. Um, and, you know, the, uh, these are all preliminary construction costs, but these are ones that we vetted these plans with local builders and local trades to get estimates on all the things that we put into these buildings to get the numbers. And I think um, it does move the needle for the pro forma because, um, you know, I mean, anyone who's done a pro forma knows you have your hard cost and your soft cost. Um, and so this is that significant soft cost um, that's really being, you know, moved down to a couple hundred dollars at most to buy these plans, right? Um, and so that's where that cost savings. We know it isn't hundred thousand dollars to build a new house, um, but we and there are other tools that the city is is working on, from you know the tap fees and um, the road closure fees, right? That all start to chip away at that gap between new construction housing and, and um, affordable home prices. So uh, just one more uh, in, in addition to that, um, one of the other key parts about um, stock plan buildings um, is that they often have cost items that are sort of hidden to the sort of naked eye. Um, many stock plan buildings have really complicated roof lines um, that's just a lot of cost. Um, many of these buildings are very, very modest in terms of their floor plan size, or we have the ability to add on. Um, that's also because new construction for anything uh, in 2022 um, is quite expensive. Um, and, and, and everyone's probably heard now about material shortages, wood shortages, labor shortages, uh, all those things. Uh, and as I've worked with folks with building buildings right now on the construction in South Bend, uh, other small developers in the city um, we faced all of those things uh, during the process of building these buildings. It was like a weekly reminder of, oh yeah, so since we started this two months ago, lumber prices went up 34%, right? It's really good that we don't waste any lumber and we have really, really um, efficient wall layouts and, and so forth. So um, some of those things are not typically thought of in a stock plan. It's sort of the base most, most least, you know, what's the code minimum? Um, and so um, trying to um, work backwards from there to have cost effective layouts, as well as being able to take advantage of, um, you know, not overdoing things in terms of material costs. Um, th those are key things that are often not thought of in plans that are cheap. And, 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 the, and the, the smaller the building, the less thought that goes into it, uh, which is why most stock plans don't have porch details, don't have window trim details, uh, don't have you know decent wall sections beyond the bare minimum thing to get a permit. Most cities don't even require, most of these don't require, she said, many of the details that are in these sets. So we're hoping that the overall quality of the buildings will, will increase slightly because there's nothing worse than, well, what do we build today? Well, I don't know. Whoa, hey, look at this, there's actually a drawing. It's easier just to build something that's put in front of you than to have to think about doing something different. So um, I think those are some of the things that will be improved at a baseline level um, if, if, because there's no, there's a, it's a path of least resistance at that point. So um, question here about does South Bend encourage people to use uh, reclaimed materials uh, and salvage? Um, there's a couple of different ways to answer that question, but uh, perhaps, although a lot of good buildings have probably already met their demise before those things happening. Um, and Marty, I, I'm gonna maybe toss this back at you as well, unless Jen, you have uh, input on that because I, I, I've heard of some programs or some different people doing that, but I, I don't know if Jen and I have that knowledge locally about what's happening there. Well, I would like to say yes, Allison, but the answer is no to a mandate. Um, that's for sure. I, I, I've never heard of that. I think it has, like Jim says, I know it has been tried in a number of cities. There's, there's people deconstructing houses in, in Cleveland, for example, and, and, and um, uh, somebody in Wisconsin doing it as well. Um, and the folks who are doing that are typically also doing it as sort of a job training. It's sort of a, a, a social endeavor in the sense that they're, they're salvaging materials. They're also using the opportunity as a job training um, 
uh, uh, chance um, in many cases, you know, working with you know people coming out of the uh, coming out of incarceration or something like that, where they're getting on the site job training. But in South Bend, unfortunately, no, there is there are no mandates for that at all. Um, in terms of using reclaimed materials in buildings, um, I certainly think there would be no barrier to doing that, depending on yeah. what you're trying to do. Um, you know, certainly things like countertops or cabinetry or flooring or I mean, I'm assuming Jennifer, even even windows, um, you know, those things could be incorporated into these designs without much trouble. Yeah, there's nothing that says you can't use yeah. all reclaimed building materials on on any of these. Um, and as far as I know, I mean, the zoning doesn't say anything about it, um, which is where I I'm more familiar with or aware of. Um, like Marty said, there's nothing that mandates it. There's probably incentive programs and things like that. And that's what we see in most other cities as well that would provide um, incentives to doing it, but nothing that requires it. But it is an interesting thought. You know, I mean, um, mm -hmm. we, we really didn't want to add, we didn't want these to add any more red tape um, to the process. So we're not requiring things, um, or very much anyway, uh, um, above and beyond the zoning. And I say that, so the example I showed from Bryan, Texas, um, they don't have um, a lot of the things that South Bend has done to their zoning ordinance. So they used pre-approved buildings, they call them pattern zoning, as a way to um, allow these building types, but also incentivize things like street trees, right? Providing a tree or providing um, a porch. Um, or using less parking, right? So they have to go through and they have a bunch more regulations that go along as precursors to using the um, their pre-approved buildings. In South Bend, we really wanted to say, hey, we've, we've made the rules um, in the zoning code to allow these and make these as easy as possible to build. So we're not adding any additional rules besides you have to follow you know, this architectural set. Um, in terms of site plan and things like that, we're not adding any additional. Um, and that was strictly so that these are not seen, we don't want them to be seen as more cumbersome or more work um, for people uh, to use. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, it, it allows for the flexibility to a builder say, I only use this, you know, hardy board, I only use vinyl siding. So I, can I do all these details in, in vinyl? You know, as long as it meets the the character and the um, dimensions of it, um, the city is sort of that um, because there are you're going through them and you have to go through the permit process. They have the final say on that, but we really um, allow for a lot of flexibility, right? So you can't change the proportions of the windows, but you can use any window manufacturer that fits your your budget or your need or reclaimed windows, right? Um, things like that. Yeah, for the first five, they're all two stories. We do show an option um, in the permit set for the carriage house that shows it um, as a one story. So if you didn't wanna do it over a garage and you just wanted sort of an in-law um, unit in your backyard. Um, That's a good, a good point. I forgot that was a we good, do good show change. that yeah. um, specifically so it could be used as a cottage. So this building, in the permit set, not in the building catalog, it, it shows a one story option that would just have a door into the yard um, if you didn't want that garage. Um, and we've talked about future ones, um, but I think Jim mentioned this, right? There, um, a lot of builders are doing one story plans, um, but it's really finding this program um, that provides for sort of the same, um, three bedrooms, two baths as a, you know, a, a suburban style house, but making it work on a, on a narrow lot and fitting the character of these neighborhoods. Um, so that's not out of the cards. We're, we'll love to do it. I think actually we're hoping to do it um, in the future. Um, but it would be nice to see, it would be nice to see a one story version that was fully accessible as well. Like a one story yeah. fully accessible house would be an interesting Absolutely. option to put in the catalog. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all. Feel free to, um, we, we will relay that back to 
uh, community investment too. Um, but I think this is sort of an this is an experiment in some ways. And so um, if there's interest in using this process and if there's excitement for it, that opens the door to do more um, more options. And I think the discussion was always had in in with the city and with us that if um, if someone were to take you know the duplex or the narrow house and and hire an architect and do another design for it, um, that was really great and and you know um, or added to the variety that that could in the future be incorporated as a pre-approved plan, right? It could be adopted as a pre-approved plan that they offer elsewhere if if the person wanted that. Um, and so there's all these things, there's, there's a lot of possibilities. Um. Uh, one thing I thought I would add to, um, this is a perfect slide to bring up. One of the fun things that happens when you talk to a lot of people about concepts and ideas, and I've worked on uh, some model building processes and some, uh, some projects with builders uh, in, in Michigan as well, and, and here in Minnesota, where I'm at. Uh, one of the funny things is that um, there's a huge variety of what people think is normal. And um, so when we took some of these floor plans, uh, these uh, elevations to uh, different builders, uh, see here on the, on the right-hand side, option C, it has a solid uh, you know, um, um, set of, uh, yeah. of areas between the posts uh, versus option A, which is leading more towards having railings, okay? Um, and, and what's funny is that you talk to one builder and he said, gosh, see, that's just a slam dunk. That's so easy. You can detail that well, won't leak. And, and like, that's, that's the way to go. And then you talk to, you know, another builder and they say, gee, C would just be so much work. I do every, I do option A, you know, every day and twice on Sunday. And you're like, you know, what, what? <laughs> what's the wow like there's a completely opposite reaction so one of the things that uh you sort of realize is that there's such a variety of existing sort of ideas of what's easy and what people are used to that we think that that's actually in and of itself going to drive some um variety of choice based on builder preferences based on owner preferences um and so we we got we got less worried as we went along when we had to like come to terms with, well, there's literally no way to make both those parties happy. That's probably a good thing for, for visual diversity and, and for how the, the, the sort of cultural tendencies of how this might turn out. So uh, it's one of those things that you don't think about until it happens and you're like, yeah, this is actually going to be okay. We've turns out as, as a civilization and been building cities for like in this manner, at least for a good 150, 200 years in this country. Um, and so it, 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 it would, it's, it's funny enough that other, other built forms that we have in, in, in our neighborhoods and the way that we built in the, in the last say 50 or 75 years that have a great deal of monotony. Uh, it turns out when, when we are working, especially on the, the narrower lots in the, in, in sort of traditional hundred year old neighborhoods that we do see more variety uh, then you see uh, from a builder who's building 100 units all at once in one subdivision. We don't expect to see a lot of that in these infill lots in South Bend. If we did, it'd probably be happening already. And that's part of the reason why we need, we need these plans to help uh, because uh, we, those monotonous uh, houses built by one builder over a year's time, you know, one after another, is maybe luckily not coming to some of the South Bend neighborhoods because I don't think it would do the character uh, of, of most South Bend neighborhoods justice. And so that's partly what we were um, motivated by was to, to take the efficiencies of an operation who wanted to build 100 houses by and but being able to democratize that great design uh, across many hands. And so we, we do hope that you all who are the many hands, hopefully, uh, whether today or tomorrow or in the future, um, or we'll pass this information along to somebody is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll follow through on that. Uh, I'm sure the city will put some good guidelines behind that, but um, we, we were uh, careful not to lock this down so tight um, that that uh, great creativity couldn't be uh, harnessed. Continues to be a lot of interest in the one story house, guys. We're gonna have to bring that back to the planning team and say, the we, community we, we is aired, asking for a one-story version. Yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> I am curious, and and I know Jim and I have talked about this um, a little bit, but I think um, 
the one story house is uh, certainly you can do right at grade to make the ground floor accessible. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, you know, I recently did a, a, um, a design for Village Village was, that's been looking at, you know, cottage courts in the, the Northwest side. Um, and we started at, you know, those one story cottages so that they were really facilitated towards, towards seniors. Um, and then we went away from it because it didn't pan out. But I think one of the things we have to acknowledge is sort of on these narrow lots, what are, what are the building programs that you want to see in a one story cottage? Is it two bedrooms, one bath? Because um, on a 33 foot lot, we've done this many times, Jim and I, and uh, it's super, so I'm happy to just throw your program in and then I'll try it out. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so tight that on, you know, a two bedroom, one bath, single story cottage works great. We can do it all day. Um, but then as soon as you add that second bath to make it two bedroom or one and a half, two baths, it gets much trickier to fit on a narrow lot. You have a lot of width going back to do things and you can do a deeper building. Um, but we, what we run up against is that the floor plans aren't as open and spacious as you need them to be, right? Um, or you have a lot of hallway to connect all that up. Or you have a long, you know, hallway that isn't the most efficient design. And so that's, you know, you very quickly lose that efficiency of a one story um, that are that are baked into this these plans. And so that's I'm I I think we we will definitely we want to and we've got um, plans that we're trying we're grappling with. But in the first round, it didn't make sense because you do lose some of that efficiency while not meeting you know, those, those market, um, residential market studies and, and the developers that we talked to want a certain program, a certain size square footage, um, right, small enough to keep it affordable, but big enough that it meets the needs of, of um, the target audiences. Um, and so that's the game, right, that we're playing or trying to find. It's not a game, it's, it's a challenge for us as architects, but, um, and a really fun one at that. Um, to meet all these needs, right? To a building that contributes to the neighborhood, to the street. So the building that holds the street um, and can sit up and have a porch like most of the other houses do, um, but also um, provide an adequate, you know, plan. So that's that's something we can continue to, and, and it's good to have that feedback. Uh, yeah, a couple other things on that note before we wrap up here as we are reaching the end of our time. There was a very conscious effort uh, to be able to not oversize the housing uh, because of the cost per square foot that's sort of prevalent now. And it just is a basic construction for anything you're doing. Um, so the idea of in, in various configurations, um, trying to find solutions that uh, were between $175,000 and, and, and $300,000 for, for single unit buildings. Um, and, and that's basically by not getting too big and, and that's how you have to start the process. There's plenty of housing on the market in South Bend, not in every neighborhood, but there's housing on the market for 300,000, 400, $500,000. And so that was the price point as it relates to size of the number of square feet um, was another conscious effort in this endeavor uh, because there's another sort of hole in the marketplace for smaller buildings. And so there's also this weird um, notion that's out in the builder marketplace that no one wants a two one uh, thousand square foot single story house, which we know I is not with, true. With but, you uh, that the NNN has some great examples, yes. and yes, a two bed one bath works all day and should absolutely be in this catalog. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Um, um, and one of the challenges is that the home builder, the shortage we have, shortages we have of, of labor and of businesses building homes in this country today means that there's more work to do than there are builders to build the work. And so if you are a builder with a choice where you can build a big house or a small house and largely builders are paid by a percentage of the total cost of the house, where are you going to spend your time and money on a project? Well, most folks, because of that relentless math of the fee that they, they get for the same amount of effort, they choose to build bigger houses. And so 
we're trying to find different ways to be able to provide um, these plans so that it is easier and quicker uh, and let the least amount of brain damage possible for builders to build a product that is smaller because they can do it more efficiently, very cost effective, um, and because that they can see a market for it um, in, in the neighborhood. And, and those are just uphill economic headwinds that the projects like these face. And so we're trying to be able to, in some cases, sell builders as much as we want to sell yeah. to residents and Absolutely. small developers that this is, this is something that people want to have. And so um, we appreciate everybody doing this because um, this just drives a marketplace that is being unserved and we're hoping to be a part of that solution. So, and I, um, can I pick, I, we might be out of time. Yes. And I may be getting in the weeds here, but um, I wanted to respond, Rick, you're absolutely right that there, you know, has, Chicago where, I, where I'm at has some of the similar longer sized lots. Um, and you don't see a ton of one story in, in the, the near downtown neighborhoods, right? Because the property value doesn't allow for it. But you do as you get out to like the Portage Parks and the, the sort of the first ring neighborhoods um, that are still in Chicago proper. But this is the interesting thing. So we designed a similar to the Chicago bungalow, right? Which is one and a half stories. So that second floor is in the roof, right? That's a really traditional product that you see in Chicago, probably in South Bend too. Um, I mean, I know you do in South Bend too. Um, it's adorable and it's awesome and it's efficient, but we talk to builders about it. Um, I've actually talked to ones here um, in Chicago as well as Jim's conversation with South Bend. And what we learned was that those half stories were less cost effective. So no one wanted to do what we call a knee wall, a half wall on that second floor, because you couldn't use standard size lumber, right? The builders are, are fine doing it, but it doesn't save you money to do that half floor is what the feedback we were getting, right, Jim? Um, yeah, there's, there's basically one builder in town who, who has, a, has a thought process, and that's because he's not using standard two by four stick framing, and that's how he Does is it. able to do yeah. it better and more cost effective. He's using a different, completely different framing system, right? And that works for their system. So yeah, sans that, anyone else using regular two by fours and two by sixes, they're not much for it, right? And that's yeah. And you, you know, the chats we have with like, there's climate control issues, there's HVAC, HVAC. So as a designer, I was like, ooh, we can get this space hidden in the, you know, and still get a one story and make it really efficient and great from a design perspective. But all of the feedback that we got um, was that it wasn't cost effective to do that today with our, with our more, you know, our contemporary systems. And so that was a really, that was this feedback loop that was happening throughout the design process, um, you know, even at the beginning with these the ten buildings. So you're probably better off in that case with with the with the basement with the egress window. If you need to right. grow into additional space, than you are with the half story, uh, the inefficient yeah. half story up above. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. One story with a basement has been uh, in 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 my nose in the field here. That that has been the the the, the two bed the two bed one bathroom with the with the with the the tight tight perimeter so your basement's not too big uh, that's the other thing too when 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 the one-story houses get too big um because they're they're all in one story the basements get really big and so uh, that that can become quite costly to dig out and um that 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 foundation is actually a pretty costly uh piece of the puzzle so, right 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 um well, i think Jen, did you share your contact information I did. You on a slide I earlier I just, oh, there you go there you, okay just popped in you my just did now. jim and if you're, if you're willing to put your email in there as absolutely. well absolutely i'll free. do that as well um oh, some perfect. other good feedback from uh from allison and ann too about the one-story houses there um, yeah i appreciate that it's, um yeah. and i think um you know liz meredith at the city and the Department of Community Investment is, is who you would call to talk more to the city about it. I think there'll be more. Um, we're hoping to get it up on the Build South Bend website, certainly this slideshow, but also more info really soon. Um, yeah, I'd like to say this recording will be posted. So if you had a friend or uh, another co-developer in the city who didn't get a chance to be here tonight, I'll do my best to get this recording posted soon, uh, quicker than last time. Uh, Jen also just indicated we're going to get this PowerPoint presentation available and we will put it up on the Build South Bend website, which is 
southbendin.gov slash BSB, Build South Bend. So hopefully here within the next couple of days, this presentation will be available if you wanna take a look at it there or share it with other folks um, who might be interested in taking a peek. One last plug, uh, we, we do really welcome your, your input. If you're seeing folks from the Department of Community Investment, please tell them that you like this. Um, there is definitely a sense of we're not going to do any more of these unless the ones that we have go somewhere, which is a prudent thought process about how to invest public dollars. If you think this is a good idea, if you think you want to do this in the future, please be vocal um, because, you know, this is your community. This is how the character, if these are the things you want to see more of in your community, if you're never going to build one, tell the folks um, at, at uh, both the mayoral level and the mayor's, the mayor's office, as well as the, the, the all levels of the Department of Community Investment, because um, this, this is only an idea unless y'all support it and, and want to follow through on it and, and, and our neighbors supporting this kind of work. So um, if you like it, so we're getting all these positive comments, we, we appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, but the, fo the folks that really need to hear from are the folks who help make the decisions to pay for it and support the project. And we need interest to keep, keep the project growing and being uh, seen as successful. So thank you for your consideration. And please do, uh, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to any of the folks in the city to, uh, to, to, repeat, to mention your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, thank you for all the feedback and for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. And like I said, we, um, as designers, this isn't our, you know, typical project and it's, but it's something all the design team, Pat, Jen, Jim, and I, um, felt really strongly that it was an opportunity and a resource that was needed in many cities. Um, as architects, we find ourselves more and more having to only being afforded for high and residential and things like that. And it's a, it's a, that's a problem in our, in our profession, in our field. And, and so this is, these are the projects that us as really small entities um, love to build and love to design, and and they're um, and it makes sense for a city to to um, offer them. Um, yeah. And so we're excited and hopeful, but we can only do more of this type of work if if they they get built, if they start being used. So um, we hope they will be for sure. And I I have faith. Every time I go to South Bend, I meet more people that are like willing and able and creative to do this work and um, it's always really encouraging. Yeah. So before we say goodbye and, and, and thank you to Jennifer and Jim, I do wanna plug the next session, which is gonna be on, in February. I don't actually have the date in front of me, I think February 17th. Um, we're gonna take a different tack. We're gonna have um, a, a bigger developer who has done work up by Notre Dame and has built some multi-million dollar things talk to us about value like a value exercise for how he does his process and saying like does this building pencil out and does the process pencil out so not on the scale of the rest of the series although he's going to bring you know he's going to he's going to talk about it from a from a perspective that might fit a neighborhood um but that'll be the next month and then the one after that i think we're going to circle back around to our deeper dive into building and zoning codes when it comes to these buildings pre-approved or not um on your sites so Thank you to Jen. Thank you to Jim. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, really great, great conversation. I knew this would be a great session and it, and it, and it was. So real quick, the first contact would be the Department of Community Investment. Probably Liz Meredith. Um, but start Barbara, there. Barbara, you can also just ask me. I'll, okay. I'll, 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 I'll figure I'll it out. You. I'll okay. Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Sure thing. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Yep.